Okay, so then let's uh, continue with the, the regular class. So, last time we were talking about the uncertainty analysis in uh, returns. So we finished up saying that we can do some simulation of the different situations and forecasts and then we can get a better idea of whether we should do the project or not. So here is a group question. So I assume that you are the person at Disney who is given the result of this simulation. So they give you this result of the simulation here. The medium NPV is close to your cash flow calculated NPV of 2.8 billion. So the medium is around here, right? This is what we expect will happen. Most likely, we'll have a 2.8 million billion positive net present value. However, there is a 12% probability that the project could have a negative net present value. So if we look at this part of the graph here, that's 12%. So there's a 12% probability we could lose money, have a negative net present value. And also we could have a large negative value here. We could have a minus three, there's a small possibility we could have a minus three billion. We could lose three billion on this investment. So how would you use this information? A, I would accept the investment, print the results, and put them away to show that I checked everything properly. If there's a problem later, we lose this money, I can show my CEO. I already checked this and I decided it was worth taking the risk. Number B, I would reject the investment because this 12% where I could lose money is too high a risk for, on a project. C, I would accept the investment, but use the result of the simulation to guide how I manage the project in the future. So I use the results of the simulation to guide how I manage the project. I can see there might be a big risk of the operating expenses or so on. So discuss with your partner, what are you going to do with this simulation? A, B or C? Okay, so let's have a show of hands. Who says A? Hands up A. Who says B? Hands up B. Who says C? Hands up C. Okay, you have to put up your hands. Only 20 people put up their hands, right? Let's start again. A. Who says A? Okay, who says B? Who says C? Okay, so the people who said B, why are you going to reject this project? Okay, B is not the correct answer. C is the correct answer. Okay, B, in the case of B, if we do that, if we take, say that we could lose money in this project, so we're not going to take this project, we're never going to take any project, ever, right? With every project, if everything goes badly, if everything goes badly, our revenues are down very low, our costs are up very high, and there's some crisis, political crisis in the country, then any project is going to lose money, right? So the main thing we are looking at with the N we have a positive NPV here, so that means yes, take the project. Okay. 
We already uh, discussed if we have a positive entropy V, we should take the project. A, there's not much point uh, when you're a financial manager, part of your job is not to cover yourself, to say, oh no, don't fire me, I, I did this and I did that, right? <coughs> In business, people are very forward looking. They're not that concerned about the past, they're very forward looking, okay? It's not very professional if you work in a business to go around blaming people about things they did last year or the year before. To go around and say, that was your fault. You did that wrong. Okay? Uh, we're in this problem because of you. If you had worked harder last year, we would be okay now. Right? That's just wasting time in business. They want to look forward. So we're not concerned with just saving ourselves. Right? So part C is the right, is the right answer. Okay? We accept the investment. But this helps us to understand more. Helps us to understand if the revenues go down, what will happen? If there's a crisis, what will happen? Okay, so uh, we talked about Disney. Now we're going to do again a practical example. Maybe we didn't understand exactly the cash flow for Disney. So we're going to do again for Aracruz. Aracruz is the Brazilian paper company. Okay. In their, their case, they are going to be making a factory, paper factory. And in this case, we are going to do the analysis for a return to the equity investors, not as a company. The last time we did as a company, we calculated return on capital. Cost of capital was our discount rate. This time we're just going to look at from the viewpoint of the equity investors. So we'll use return on equity. Return on equity is net income over book value of equity. Return on equity is also used as a performance measure for uh, companies. If I go to Disney and I go to uh, Key Statistics, then uh, <coughs> we're going to see return on equity here. Return on assets, 9%. Return on equity, 17%. So this is putting the income from last year over my book value of equity. Not market value of equity, just book value of equity. This is putting my income from last year over my assets, book value of assets. Is that a good performance measure? We talked about that in, in uh, financial statements, right? I give you some assets. You have $100,000 of assets. And last, so I give you a car and a restaurant worth $100,000. How much profit did you make? You made $9,000, your return on assets was 9%. Okay? I give you assets, a car and a restaurant worth 100000 How much profit did you make? Last year you made $20,000. Who did a better job? You made $9,000 with the same assets and she made $20,000 with the same assets. She did a better job. So we can. this is for comparing companies, right? This company made 9% on its assets. Your company made 20% on your assets last year, okay? Return on equity is the same. Profit over book value of equity, okay? So if we have less equity, this number looks higher. That's a problem. If we have more debt and less equity, this number looks higher. So return on assets is actually more accurate uh, then return on equity, okay? But we can use, if we want to get a higher return on equity, this was a problem in the financial crisis, so manager's bonus was based on return on equity. So because of that, they started to take a lot of debt and very low equity, okay? So it meant that their return on equity was very high. For example, your restaurant is 80% debt, and 20% equity, okay? And your restaurant is 100% equity, okay? So you have 100% equity. I give you $100,000. $100, so you have 100, and you made profit of 20. So 20 over 100 equals 20%. Your return on equity was 20%, okay? What about you? What was your return on equity? You have, altogether, you had $100,000. Just 20% of that is equity. So just $20,000 is equity. Okay? How much profit did you make? $9,000. So 
So your return on equity is 9 over 20. Okay, so it's about 45%. So now it looks like you did a better job than her last year. Your return on assets is lower, but your return on equity is higher. So you can understand how re return on assets is a little bit, can be a little bit better, right? Return on equity is showing you just for the equity we invested in the company. So if I want to get a higher return on equity, what will I do? I'll make this 90% debt, 10% equity, okay? Suddenly my equity is $10,000. Now look at this, I made a 90% return on equity. Looks great, right? So the problem in the financial crisis was some manager's bonus was based on return on equity. So it means that they took a lot of debt, they took a lot of loans, uh, the financial companies, okay? It looked like they did a good job. They got a very high bonus. They got paid bonuses of millions of dollars. So this is a conflict between stockholders and bondholders, right? Stockholders want a high return on equity. I invested 10 of my money in your company and you made 9 profit for me. So I invested 10 and I got back 9. I got 90% profit, right? Good for me. Okay, but it's very high debt so the bank won't be happy. They are providing the debt and if the company, the company is too risky. Her restaurant is much more risky than her restaurant. Okay? She has a high debt and she has low debt. So trade-off between stockholders and bondholders. So in this case we're going to do this based on return on equity. First, in the accounting uh, case. So we're going to do first the accounting way. For Disney we did return on capital. For this company we're going to do return on equity. But that's just the accounting way. More important is the cash flow way. Okay, so <coughs> We're going to invest 250 million Brazilian real. We're going to do this analysis in the Brazilian real. Real is the currency in Brazil. It looks, it's spelled like real in English. It can be a little bit confusing. Real is the same. Real, it's pronounced real because that's the Brazilian pronunciation, right? Like uh, some words in English have different pronunciations with the same spelling. So. Uh, at the end of year five, we're going to invest another 50 million. We're going to borrow 100 million over 10 year payments. The plant will have a life of 10 years. Okay, at the end of the 10 years, we're going to sell it. So can you understand this project? We're making a paper plant. Do you understand plant? Are we making a, a garden plant out of paper? What's another word for plant in English? Factory, right? Do you like plants? Do you have plants in your house? Yeah. Hmm? Again, a word has a different meaning, right? So, uh, we, we're deciding to make a factory. A factory is going to cost us this much. We're going to get this much of a loan. We think we're just going to have the factory for 10 years. After 10 years, we're going to sell it. Okay? An even simpler investment than Disney. So, we are going to get our hurdle rate. In this case, our hurdle rate will be the cost of equity. We already calculated before cost of equity for Aracruz. It was 20%. We need to change this to Brazilian real. We're doing this calculation in Brazilian real. So 26%. Okay? If we change our cost of equity to Brazilian real from US dollars, we're going to be adding country risk premium for Brazil. So it's going to be higher. Uh, <coughs> We can see here debt over debt plus equity is 52%. So this is our hurdle rate, 26%. Quite high, right? We need to make more than 26% a year. Later we're going to need this information. How much uh, money are we paying back of the loan? Because this is return on equity, we're going to include, at this time, our loan repayments. And here we have our accounting view, which is our net income, revenue, minus costs, minus depreciation, operating income, minus interest expense, minus tax, net income. So this is the accounting way. We find our net income every year. 
Then if we want to find our return on equity, we just get the uh, return on equity of each year by getting our uh, book value of equity, book value of equity for each year, and dividing our profit, our net income, the two important columns here is net income and book value of equity. So first year, our income is going to be 24 million. Our book value of equity, 160 million. Return on equity, 14%. We find our return on equity every year, and then we find the average. Average is 36%. Okay? Our hurdle rate was 26%. Okay? So we say yes, we should take this project according to the accounting view of the project. So, more important than the accounting view is the cash flow. So we have to change the accounting to cash flow. How do we change accounting to cash flow? Can anybody tell me? What do we have to do to change the accounting numbers to cash numbers? Add back depreciation. Add back depreciation. Subtract the capital expenditure. Subtract the change in working capital. Okay, in this case, because it's uh, for the equity investor, we are going to also subtract the principal repayment on the loan. Okay, we're not, we're just, uh, the last time we used the cost of capital as the hurdle rate, this time we're using cost of equity, so we're going to subtract out the loan payments here. So we already did that, then we get our cash flow. First year, cash flow minus 185 million, normal, right? But year one we're already making profit, that's good news, okay? This is our cash flow for each year, getting, getting bigger every year, okay? Uh, the 10th year, we can add in our salvage value. So 10th year is, is an even bigger number. We add in salvage value of the uh, factory when we sell the factory. Okay? So then we find our cash flow every year. What do we need to do next? Just add this together. Add all the cash flow together and see if it's higher than this number. What's our next step? We have to discount these cash flows. What's 106 million worth in year 10? Now. Right, we have to discount the cash flows. We are going to discount the cash flow using our cost of equity. And we find out we have a net present value of 75 million. So should we take the project or not? Take the project or don't take the project? We have a positive net present value. Take the project, right? We got our cash flows. This is our cash flow for each year, okay? Then we have our present value of the cash flow. Present value. We can notice in year 10, 181 million is worth just 33 million in today's money. Okay? Inflation is high in Brazil or the cost of equity is high. But the number is still positive. Please. So, yes? So, uh, for discounting, we use R18 45%? Yes. So, <coughs> we choose our cost of equity for the uh, discount rate. We can also find our internal rate of return using the NPV information. Okay, that's going to be around uh, 28%. We, we also have some uncertainty with Aracruz. What can change? What's going to change? Aracruz is making paper. What do you think is the biggest uncertainty for Aracruz? The biggest problem could be for Aracruz. They're making paper. They have a paper factory. What's the biggest uncertainty for them? What, what could change which could cause them problems? You're running a paper factory, making paper, right? What kind of things could change which could mean that you don't make a profit, you make a loss? Trees? What about trees? No trees. No trees, the price of my raw material, trees, goes up, right? Pulp price or, pay, or wood price goes up. Anything else? People don't need the paper. People don't pay much for paper. Paper price goes down, okay? So the, the paper's plant value can change as variable change. The biggest source of variability is the two things you mentioned, the price of paper 
and the price of pulp. Do you understand pulp? Pulp is when you mix wood with water. It's their raw material, their input. So we can again, we can just make this uh, probability analysis in Excel. If the here we have the effect of changing pulp prices. Okay. If the pulp price goes up, what's going to happen? If it goes down, what's going to happen? If the paper price changes, what's going to happen? So the paper price goes down. Our internal our uh, NPV is going to go down, obviously. Okay? So we just use this we use, we use this graph just to get a better understanding. Because we have an NPV, we're still got positive NPV. We're always going to take the project, but we just do this to understand what will happen if those things go down. So this can help us to decide whether we need to do hedging or not. Do you understand hedging? Hedging is a concept in finance where we try to make a more stable situation. So just an explanation of hedging, we say to hedge our bets. Do you understand a hedge in English? A hedge is also used in English, it's like a plant, a small plant like this. You can see some hedge outside, right? It has no relation to the financial medium, okay? No uh, relation. Hedge our bets. There's two horse, we have a two horse race, okay? We have horse A and horse B, okay? I bet on horse A, horse A loses, I lose all my money. If I hedge my bet, I bet on horse A and horse B. The bookie wins, but I don't lose much money. That's hedging, okay? Hedging is I bet on the two horses in the race. So it's the same for the paper plant. Instead of a horse race, we have paper prices. Paper prices go up, I make a big profit. Paper prices go down, I make a big loss. So what I can do, is I can bet on the price going up, but I can also bet on the price going down. How can I bet on the price going down? I can use financial products in the option markets, right? I can buy future contracts or sell future contracts to stabilize the price. So, uh, have you heard of future contracts before? Future contract is, uh, airlines often use future contracts, okay? Today the price of oil is very low, okay? Today the price of oil is $50 a barrel. Last year, it was $100 a barrel. Do you want, what are you going to do if you're an airline company? You're buying oil. Do you want to fix this price for the next five years? Or do you want to wait and see what will happen? What do you think is better for the airline company? Fixing the price of oil or waiting to see what will happen? What are you going to do if you're the manager in an airline company? Fix the price of oil? Do you understand fix? Go Jan. Fix this price for the next five years? Or wait and see what will happen? What are you going to do? Fix the price, right? Especially it's a low price. So it, that's why even though the price of oil changes, the airline ticket mightn't change that much. Okay? I can make a contract today, right, for next year. The contract next, for next year might be a little bit higher, 52, right? 2017, 53, 2018, 60, okay? I can make a contract with the oil company now. They have to sell me the oil for this price. Okay, do you understand? That's hedging. The company is hedging here. Hedging is doing it in a safe way, not betting. Right? If I want to bet, I'll do nothing. And I'll just buy my oil next year, and buy my oil next year, and buy, buy the oil next year. So, I hope the price goes down. What do you think? Will the price of oil go up or go down? In 2018. You're from Russia. You hope it goes up, right? We believe. You hope it goes up, right? So, 
It maybe it will, if you look at the historical prices. It depends on supply and demand. Also depends on geopolitics. Right now, Obama is not very happy with Russia, so the US increased their supply of oil to put pressure on the Russian economy, right? Push down the oil prices. So if Russia and the US make up, maybe the price of oil will go up again, right? The US doesn't think it needs to pressurize Russia anymore. So different things affect price of oil. But if we are a company, we prefer to fix it so we can be sure about the future. Okay? So these kind of things we can we are going to discuss about for this company. So this is a group question. Should you hedge or not? So the value of this plant is very much a function of paper and pulp prices. There are future contracts. Future contract is simply make a contract in the future. Okay? Uh, forward contract, similar option. Contract means I can make this contract, but I have the option to keep this contract or throw it away. I pay some premium, it means I have this option. I can buy the price oil for this price. That's even better, right? If the oil price goes down, I can tear up the contract, buy the, buy the cheaper oil. But I have to pay a premium, like insurance premium for this. That's an options contract. So we can do these things on paper and pulp. So we're selling paper. We could sell our paper already to somebody at today's price, four years later. So what do you think? Should it hedge against the paper prices or not? Explain. The value of the plant is also a function of exchange rates. Should Aracruz hedge against exchange rates? Because Aracruz is getting its revenue from the US. Okay? So what happens if they're selling paper to the US? What would be the bad situation for Aracruz? The US dollar gets stronger or weaker? Weaker. Weaker, right? The US dollar gets weaker. The, the uh, price of the paper in dollars stays the same, right? Then I'm going to get back less real. Say that today, one dollar is equals to five real. Okay? Then the US dollar gets weaker. What's going to happen? One dollar is going to be equals to how many real? Three. One dollar is going to be equals to three real. Okay, US dollar got weaker. I sell my paper to the US company for hundred dollars. How much will I get in situation A? Five hundred real. How much will I get in situation B? Three hundred. Which is better? A. A. So this is a risk, right? Do you think the US dollar will get weaker against the real, or the real will get weaker against the dollar? Hmm? Let's have a look and see that the the real. Usually people would think Brazil has higher inflation, so over the long term, the uh, real has higher inflation. Which Is it going to get weaker or stronger, the currency with higher inflation? Russian students, currency with higher inflation, is it going to get weaker or stronger over the long term? Yes. Your currency has high inflation, it's going to get weaker over the long term. Okay? That makes sense because of the price of things. So currently, one dollar is three Brazilian real. <coughs> so, uh, if we look at the chart, we can see that the real was getting a very stronger against the dollar, opposite to what we'd expect. So this is the 10 year chart. We can see that in 2006, the real used to be up here, and then it came down gradually over long term against the US dollar. But we can see how, how risky it is. In 2012, one Brazilian real, one dollar was 1.5 reals. Just now, uh, one US dollar is 3.25 reals. That's a big change, right? So actually, that's in that case, we're selling paper. That's good news for the paper company. If we're selling to the US. Okay. It was one real. We were getting a hundred dollars. Was a hundred real. Now it's one dollar is three real. So one hundred dollars is now three hundred real. Okay. We have to pay our wages in real and pay our suppliers in real, Brazilian real. Okay. 
But it could have gone the other way from here. It could have been like this, going down. So should we hedge this risk? What do you think? We can make a forward contract to exchange the money at today's exchange rate next year or two years later. Okay? So should we, keep our, should we keep our paper price the same by making a future contract? Should we keep our exchange rate the same by making a future contract? Yes or no? Discuss with your partner these two questions. So discuss with your partner. You have to choose yes or no. Are you going to hedge or not hedge? Try to keep the prices the same. Or not? Price of paper and exchange rate. So where is where is the attendance list? This route into the Okay, so let's have a show of hands for the first one. Who says yes, we should hedge? We should hedge, yes. Paper price, we should fix the paper price by making future contracts. Okay, no, we should just wait and see what happens. Okay, why did you say no? So it depends, right? If you think the paper price will go up in the future, then you might say, paper price is going to go up, I think, not go down. So I don't need to hedge, right? But if you think the paper price is very volatile and you don't understand anything about the paper price, it might be better to hedge. Fix the paper price, okay? If you look at the past trends, is the paper price currently very high in history? Maybe I should fix it. Is it currently very low in history? Maybe it will get higher. Maybe I don't need to fix it. Okay? What about the second one? Who is going to try to fix the exchange rate? Hands up. Who is not going to try and fix the exchange rate? Why not? Uh, because as a result, the exchange rate is uh, going up, so it's, uh, more prof it's more profitable for Brazil to not to... So you think the exchange rate is going to continue going this way? Yes. So you think, you look at the history, you look at the trends, mm -hmm. and you say, I can actually get advantage from the exchange rate, right? So you could do that, but you have to be careful that you're not getting involved in foreign exchange trading, right? Your main business is selling paper. One Brazilian company got caught like that before, in the past, nearly went bankrupt. They got too excited because they were making so much money from the foreign exchange trading that they, they started to do more foreign, ex more foreign exchange trading than their actual business, and they had trouble. So we could do a combination, right? We could do 50% 50% future contract to keep this fixed, and 50% we could allow it to go up. We could use that way, right? In the international financial management class, we can find out more about those things, but just for now, we can say that it depends on the situation. So when we do hedging, we follow these steps. What is the cost to the firm of hedging the risk? Is there a big fee? Sometimes there's a big fee, especially for options contract. So there's not much cost, we can go on. High cost, can we get a very big benefit from this hedging? No, then high cost, no big benefit, don't hedge, okay? 
High cost, big benefit, yes. Okay? Uh, then the cost is not that high. Can we get a big benefit? Yes, then hedge. Okay? No, then maybe we won't hedge. Okay? So can our, we also can think, can the marginal investor hedge this risk? So sometimes our investors are already hedging the risk of the Brazilian currency because our marginal investor could be a global investor who invested in different countries around the world. So uh, we're, we're not go you can read this in your own time if you like about uh, Sensiant Technologies, is a, the Indian company. It's just calculating the, for the acquisition. When we make an acquisition, that's also a project. Do you understand acquisition? Do you understand acquisition? What does it mean, acquisition? What does acquisition mean? Buy a new company, right? So if we buy a new company to add to our company, we have to see, calculate the new cash flows. Is there going to be new cash flows and so on? Okay. So, uh, what are those new cash flows going to be? Have a positive NPV or a negative one? So we we just uh, do the same thing for acquisitions. So just we'll uh, go over this part because we need to move on to the next uh, area. So, do you have any question about uh, return? Does anybody have any question about calculating return? So in the next class we will begin to talk about the capital structure. So it means how is there an ideal level of uh, debt and equity that our company should have? For certain companies, is it better to have more debt or more equity? Uh, that kind of thing. Also, we we still need to discuss about dividends. So. If we look at the first principles, we discussed about the main part of this course is to find the hurdle rate, which shows the riskiness of the investment, and then the return. So your project is based on finding the cost of capital, the hurdle rate, right? And then we use this hurdle rate when we're calculating the return. We use that as the discount rate for our net present value. Okay, that's what it costs us for the money. So we, for the return, we calculate all the cash flows each year. We find the present value using our cost of capital as the discount rate. And then we decide. Positive net present value, invest. Negative net present value, don't invest. Okay? Then we just need to decide here, what's the best mix of debt and equity? Okay? What's the best type of debt to have? And then how much dividends should we return to the owners? Should we keep the money in the company or return to the owners? So we'll finish talking about those points uh, next week. Okay. So then uh, let's finish there for today. If you have any other question about your project, you can ask me at the end of the class.